Okay, picking up where we left off on page 178, we're talking about the, the types of communication software. Uh, browsing. Uh, browsing is fairly obvious. Everyone knows what browsing is. I'm using a browser on my machine to connect to somebody on the internet. Video conferencing. That's pretty good. It's kind of sort of what we're doing now, but it's two-way, where you have a camera and I have a camera. Works pretty cool. I will tell you that, you know, living in an army town where soldiers are deployed, uh, doing video conferencing is a fantastic way, you know, for soldiers to talk to their dependents at home. Chat room. This is just a you know, specialized piece of software on a web page that allows people to do you know, real-time kind of a, a conversation going on. Most of those are, are near, near synchronous. I mean, I, I can, um, I can uh, see you typing, and then I type, and you type, and you type, and there's no, there's no time waiting for something to happen. Voice over IP, uh, that's not really a, a something that you do on your computer necessarily. But um, again, you can buy one of those cool little things, as seen on TV, you know, little gadgets you plug into your internet and then uh, allow you to talk on your phone. I'll tell you a story. So here's a person who has uh, had AT&T digital subscriber line, okay, running to their home. And so uh, that was their internet connection. And so then they go and get Magic Jack or one of the brand names and they take it home and they plug it in and go, aha. I don't need a phone company anymore. So they call up the phone company and say, I'd like to, to cancel my service. And they go, okay. So they cancel their voice and their DSL service to their house. And then they, hey, my phone don't work anymore. Well, you got rid of your internet connection. So yeah, voice over internet means I gotta be paying somebody for the internet. I don't necessarily have to be paying for the phone calls, but I definitely gotta be paying for the internet. Discussion forums, we have some here in Blackboard where you can go in and discuss things. Uh, web feeds, uh, I have a subscription service that I use, so to speak. I, I subscribe to topics. So I go to this website um, called Daily Rotation. That's mine. Ooh, uh, good stuff. So, daily rotation. And this is just a bunch of topics. And you can go in and, and pick things that are of interest to you, and it will feed you news headlines based upon your subscription list. Now, I'm not logged in here, so I just get the generic ones. But here's headlines that are of interest to me. Okay, well, let's get back. So, um, email, everyone knows what email is. I'm sending messages back and forth to Grandma. Uh, wireless messaging, yeah, it's kind of sort of the same thing. I'm using my phone and using text messages. And then FTP, which is kind of the, one of the older technologies around for doing file transfers from one machine to another machine. And the example I gave you guys was uh, I authored a website on my machine and I want to transmit it up to wherever the hosting server is. And so I'm using FTP to do the transfer. Okay, so those are some examples of some, communi some communication software. On page 179, they talk about security tools. And the first thing they talk about is a personal firewall. Now, I don't have a third-party firewall on my machine. I just have the, the one that comes with Windows. And so if I go here to my control panel, down here at the bottom, there's this thing called Windows Firewall. And this tells me, you know, how things are set up and what I allow and what I don't. And there's some kind of paranoia levels you can go in and you can allow and disallow certain things. Most people, this is well beyond their limit, okay? And so they just kind of turn it on and go, I guess it's working because I ain't going to mess with it. So, and I would kind of encourage you, unless you're a, a computer geek, uh, don't go in there and start fiddling with any of this stuff. Just leave it the heck alone. Antivirus software. Once again, I don't necessarily have um, a third-party piece of software. I kind of sort of do. I've got uh, Microsoft's um, Security Essentials. And uh, this allows me to, you know, do scans and make sure my machine is, is, is free of, of nasty things. Um, there's an entire chapter coming up talking about the you know, spyware and, and adware, but let me just hit the highlights here. So bottom line is uh, spyware is 
software that gets installed on your machine by some methods, typically you hitting a link in an email or on a website. And what it's designed to do is to look at your machine and pull interesting information, pull credit card information, pull passwords, pull all sorts of stuff from your, your computer. It's spying on you. Now it could be something relatively innocuous, innocuous, such as uh, it's keeping track of what websites you go to. Now, some people might say, well, I'm offended, my God. I don't want them to know that I go to these porn sites. I mean, these websites. That could be. Other people say, like, eh, whatever. So, the, the, the depth of spying kind of goes from, eh, to, oh, my God. That's illegal. Okay, cool. Adware. Adware is one of those things where it doesn't, maybe it doesn't actually do any harm, but it's annoying as hell. It's uh, every time I launch my browser, I get a pop up for Viagra or whatever, uh, and I don't like that, and so I have to close it every single time. So I'm annoyed. So eh, spyware and adware, we got an entire chapter on that, so we'll deal with that later. Up on page 182, they talk about the tools that you would use to deal with that. You know, the spyware removal tools, and and I will tell you, this is the this is one of the craziest things about the internet. There are spyware removal tools on the internet which do not remove spyware but instead install spyware yes there are fake anti-malware software out there that do not do anything but install bad stuff on your machine <laughs> oh yeah so don't just go to the internet search and say you know malware removal Man, you, you better be paying attention. You ought to be looking at the ratings. You'll be downloading it from a reputable site. I mean, just word to the wise, guys. Okay. Same thing with ad remover. There's some pretty good ones out there. Uh, other types of security tools. Now, most of the time, your browser itself has some built-in kinds of protection for you to keep you out of trouble. One is internet filters. Uh, I can set it up so I can put on the, the, the child mode, for example, where... Um, it blocks certain types of content. It's sort of like the the ratings on the movies and on the TVs. You know, if it's <clears throat> you know PG thirteen, well then yeah they can go to that website. Now the problem is, is that the website manufacturers, you know, people who write these websites, have to participate and they have to put the rating in there. So otherwise the rating system really doesn't work all that well. Anti spam. Yeah, my uh, my Microsoft Outlook looks at at the incoming stuff and goes, uh, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to help this guy, and I'm gonna mark this as spam because I think this is really bad. Uh, web filters again, I can go in there and put child mode on. Phishing filters, the same thing on email, and again, we'll talk about all this stuff up. You know, pop up blockers, and in some cases, for example, when using Microsoft uh, Internet Explorer. Uh, Pointing to Blackboard, I have to turn the pop-up blocker off for that one website. Otherwise, some of the things don't work. Okay, page 185, you talk about image viewer one more time. You know how I this little guy allows me to pop through and look at images. You know, boink, boink, that guy. Okay. Um, there are some other tools. One of the big ones on pen, page 186 is the disk cleanup tool. Uh, this is kind of hidden. And, you know, if, if you want to do this on Windows 7, you really got to do it. I mean, it is kind of sort of hidden way around there uh, I mean isn't that pretty deep so it was inside accessories inside system tools and finally I get to disk cleanup and so disk cleanup is going to go through and look at my machine and figure out what files I can throw away and what, which ones I want I will caution you though so if you're running low on disk space this is a pretty cool tool to do because it'll go through and, and possibly remove lots and lots this guy right here, these temporary internet files, um, there's some stuff that gets deleted here. Let's say, for example, you go to this website and you told it to save your password, and uh, you weren't really paying too much attention because you always go back there and it all automatically remembers you. If you do this little cleanup, it is possible that the next time you go to that website, it's going to say, uh, who are you? And you're going to go, oh, man, I don't remember that password. Dang. So, you know, you have to hit the little button where it says forgot password, and you have to wait for them to email it to you, and then you have to open the email, then you go back to the website. So, yes, this is a great tool, 
it also has some problems. Okay, enough of that. Keep going. Disk uh, defragmenter on page 186. Um, the hard drives are designed to be very, very fast, and when you had a hard drive, uh, you deleted a file. It, it didn't actually delete the file, it just kind of marked it as unused. And so you end up with chunks of unused spaces scattered all over your disk. And so if I create a file that was this big, it probably fit in the amount of space. But then the file got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And every time it got bigger, it moved around the disk. It's one part was up here, the next part was over here, the next part was over here, the next part was over here. It got fragmented. And it made for things to be slower. Uh, so there's disk defragmenting tools. And once again, uh, you can use the stuff that's available uh, inside Microsoft. It works pretty good. And once again, if you're not happy with that, you can go in and do some other things. So here's the disk defragmenter. One of the things you can do is it can look to see whether or not your disk needs to be defragmented. Now I will tell you that uh, if you bought a brand new tablet or uh, one of the smaller devices, it probably comes with a solid state disk, an SSD, and those don't require any defragmenting. In the later versions of the operating system, it'll detect that it's an SSD and, and will automatically prevent you from doing unnecessary uh, defragmenting when it's not really required. Okay, so that's defragmenting. On page 187, they talk about the screen savers. To, now, in the old days, when you had a, um, you know, a phosphorus screen, you know, a cathode ray tube, um, you could get a pattern burned into the phosphor so, so that even when you turn the machine off, you can kind of eyeball it and see what was up on the screen. And so they created these things called screen savers that uh, randomly put patterns on there so that you wouldn't get a burn pattern on your, your phosphor. Well, no one's got those anymore, but screen savers are still out there, and mostly they're for energy. A screen saver kicks in and drops the machine down into low energy mode, and, and maybe it'll be entertaining, you have some cool slideshow or something going on to entertain you but it's really not have nothing to do with saving your screen anymore but hey it's pretty cool file compression tools um, yes there are techniques that you can use to compress files or compress series of files together um, I'm not certain if we're gonna need that here in this course but if we do we'll have a video on it if you were to want to turn in a dozen files through the blackboard system I would have you use compress them all together into a single file, a zip file, and then transmit just that one zip file. And so it's just a matter of, of compressing things to make them smaller. And for disk management, you, you pass one document, which contains 10, rather than passing me 10 files. Okay. And last, on page 188, they talk about, you know, a PC maintenance tools. I use a piece of software called Secunia. And Secunia is a cool little piece of software that uh, will tell me what uh, what software packages are installed and which ones need to be updated. Cool. Now, Microsoft does a pretty good job of keeping track of those things that it does. Okay, you know, so Microsoft's going to say, "Ooh, you need a patch for Microsoft Word." Okay, cool. I, I got that. But what if? Uh, you know, it was Adobe product that had installed, or some third-party piece of software. Microsoft is not going to do that. He's only Microsoft's only going to provide you advice on their own suites of software, not for third parties that they got nothing to do with. So here's a cool little routine. This is free. You download it off the internet, and it'll scan your system and report back those things that need to be updated. You know, it reports back. You know, Java updates and I mean just practically everything you need to know I use this a lot to make sure my machines are in decent shape page 188 again the last thing we're going to talk about is backup tools it's very important that you that you preserve your your machine and all your files so doing a backup and restore is a very critical kind of thing okay we are out of time so let's just uh, I'm not even going to go through the summary because that would make me create another video. But look at the stuff on page 190 and 192. And if you if you can go through with all that and you're in good shape, then you probably don't need anything more. Otherwise, go through it and read it one more time.
Okay, that's the end of this chapter. We'll see you again in some future chapter.